now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. My next guests were given what would seem a nearly impossible task, transforming the story of the renovation of Christ's tomb in Jerusalem into a life-size, three-dimensional experience right here in Washington, D.C. And the results are nothing short of miraculous. I'm now joined on set by two of the folks responsible for this amazing interactive experience at the National Geographic Museum. Archaeologist in residence, Dr. Fred Hybert, and engineer and National Geographic fellow, Corey Joukowsky. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Very interested because you were there through a lot of this process, Fred. First of all, tell me, how did this come to be? The restoration, getting these various communities, and people don't understand because they haven't been there, the Greeks, the, the uh, Catholics, the Protestants, to get everybody who have ownership over this site to agree on anything takes a millennium. What happened? How was this restoration agreed to? This restoration was actually agreed to in 1959 by the Armenian, Greek Orthodox, and Franciscan orders that okay. maintain the church. However, it took till 2016 to actually come up with a group that could fulfill the two most important parts that the church demanded in terms mm -hmm. of doing restoration. One is that the church not be closed mm. from Easter during Easter, which meant that they had something like nine months to carry out the entire renovation. Mm -hmm. And the second sort of impossible task that these restorers had to, to deliver was that they wouldn't close the shrine during the time period that it's being restored. Mm. Imagine that. Now, you're an archaeologist. You must have been overwhelmed being a part of this whole thing, being witness to it and a part of it. It was very different for me as an archaeologist. I mean, I am the archaeologist in residence at the National Geographic Society, mm -hmm. so it's not that unusual for me to be spending the sp spring in Tutankhamun's tomb right. or the fall at the Mycenaean tombs in Greece. Um, and for me, it's natural to kind of commune with the past that way. Mm -hmm. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem is like that. It's historic, it's important, but it's very different because it's a living monument as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Completely mm -hmm. different experience. Yeah. Now, in 1009, this church was demolished and then rebuilt. And it's been touched up and added to, and the accretions of time really surround the tomb of Christ. Talk to me a little bit, Corey, about the, the engineering and the technical difficulty of moving around in that type of space. And we should tell people the eticule is what this restoration focused on. Right. That's the little building, the shrine that surrounds the tomb of Christ, or what's left of it. Sure. Tell me the, the engineering challenges that presented. You bet. Yeah, well, some of the biggest challenges of working in this space is really just the complexity of it. So when we're doing this laser scanning, we're basically taking billions of 3D measurements in a space. And um, doing that in a, in a fairly rectangular room is pretty easy, but doing that in something as complex uh, geometrically as mm. the tomb and the chapel of the angel with all the hanging lamps yeah. and all the carvings on the walls, that was a, a really incredibly difficult thing to do with all those surfaces and details. And, and you used certain technologies. Uh, the, there was this uh, LIDAR. Tell me about this LIDAR. Is that a, yep. the 3D? LIDAR, yeah. And oh, it's, LIDAR. A, it's a laser scanner, and what it basically is is a laser beam that shoots out at the wall and then comes back to the sensor. Mm -hmm. And by measuring how long that takes, we can calculate the exact distance down to a fraction of a millimeter. But the really uh, complicated part is this laser beam spins around and takes 20,000 of those measurements per second. Wow. So you got to imagine, um, you know, we're in this this ancient, beautiful building, and we've got this green laser beam just striking hitting around every surface on the inside, in the place. all of the surfaces. But, but that allowed you to map out exactly. yep. uh, all of the, the, the spatial distances, and then you laid photographs on top right, of that. Right, right, right. Which people can can experience in person, and my producer went and said it's unbelievable, I mean you feel like you're there, yes. in that you're walking through and can navigate and decide what to see, not only in the Eticule, but throughout the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is right. kind of cool. Um, Fred, I want to talk about that moment when they lifted, and it's, we'll put some images up to help you understand this, when they pulled the marble casing that surrounds this tomb, you were there, you thought what? Well. Let me back up and okay. give it a little bit of context that uh, in this unbelievable agreement that they had to conserve this while the shrine is open, a group of architectural conservators from the National Technical 
University of Athens came up with this brilliant idea, literally it was brilliant, to inject liquid mortar into the building while it's standing hmm. to solidify it. And we thought that was great, everything was going along great, projects began in May, but by about June or July, someone had sort of raised their hand and said, well, how do we know that the liquid mortar won't go down onto the holy bed itself? Mm. And that's the, that's the actual slab where Christ's body so tradition tells us late. What it is, it's Christ was buried in a cave mm -hmm. for three days temporarily. Right. That cave was discovered by the, uh, the emissary of, of the... Um, uh, Roman Empire, mm. Constantine, mm -hmm. um, who found a cave, a first century AD cave, and to expose it, Constantine ordered the cave demolished. They just mm -hmm. lopped off the top of it. Well, they, so they, all the surrounding. All the, the surrounding, mm -hmm. so you could see the bed and maybe little stubs of the mm -hmm. walls. Mm -hmm. And so that bed is what has not been seen because it had then been covered with marble slabs to protect it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since. Mm -hmm. Who knows when? Yeah. And when you pulled that out, you found what? Wow. We found a lot of dust. Oh, how bad. Well, there was also that, a that lot crusader. Of dust. He had That's half of right. that crusader uh, marble. That's right. There, there, there was a substructure. There was a lower marble that probably came from a time when the church had been renovated earlier. Mm. And the date of the upper marble is something like the 16th century AD. So you can just mm. imagine what that lower marble would have dated to. Mm. And then underneath that, you could actually see the very bed. Mm. The very rock-cut bed of the tomb. Mm. Now, I have been there, and uh, years ago, there was a little icon on the wall, and when you opened it, right. you could see the stone the wall, wall right. inside. That, right. I was told, that and the bed are all that remain of the structure because it was destroyed in, what, 10, 1009. Is that what you found when you pulled off the casing? That was all that is really Believe original? Believe it or not, no. Really? No, it's not. Actually, um, another one of these high-tech toys that I, wow. as an archaeologist, don't know about, but, but the architectural conservators know about, Corey knows about, it's handheld ground-penetrating radar mm. that's pointed sideways, and you can actually use the ground-penetrating radar to tell you the structural aspect of the building. You can see if this wall is thick the whole way through, if it's, it's actually a series of layers. It's like an onion. And to the surprise of everybody, on either side of the holy bed, yeah. there was original cave wall preserved. Hmm. How high up? About six feet tall. Wow. So a lot of it is still standing. It's a miracle. Huh. Tell me what you discovered, Corey, because you used these lasers. You recorded all of this over yes. several days. Your thoughts on the structural soundness of the edicule itself, that is the, the, the shrine surrounding what's left of the tomb. I read in some reports, some of the conservationists say, it's really not up to snuff. The whole thing could collapse in addition to the dome of the church above it. Wow. Yeah, um, you know, from, from the perspective of scanning it during the restoration mm -hmm. while the supports were still up and then scanning it afterwards, yeah. you know, um, the work that's been done when you get a look at it now, you really do get the sense that it is done very well and that mm -hmm. it's, you know, built incredibly well at this point. So, you know, the, the, the terrifying part for me as an engineer was right before they took the uh, steel supports down. You know, it's been holding it up it was since the 1940s. Right, like all Fred, around yeah, it. You, right. you saw those steel supports. And so, you know, to do the, do the renovation and then take those, the cage off of it for the first time, Ooh. in, uh, you know, 80 years or so, it was, uh, it was pretty tense. So. But it's still standing. Still standing. Still standing. Mm -hmm. There is the added threat, though, that the, the building now is solidified. It's structurally safe. As uh, the director of the project says, it has a 2,000-year guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> However, what everybody noticed as they were working on this project is that the foundations right. were not touched during the conservation. And, the, co and the, mm. the substructure underneath it is badly in need of conservation. Mm. In other words, it could be a little bit like the Titanic, and it could just sort of tip over. So it needs more attention. Wow. Now, when was it decided that this restoration project would become a standing exhibit at National Geographic? 
Yeah, I think it. I think it happened sort of late in the game. I mean, yeah. I think we always wanted to make an exhibit out of it, but we were never sure of like what, what aspect that. of it. How yeah. when you know most museum exhibits are you know a series of artifacts from the location yeah, or pictures or pictures. Mm -hmm. And from this, you know, we of course had some pictures and videos, but it wasn't uh, you know artifacts that we were putting into a museum exhibit. So once we had these 3D scans um, from during the renovation and after it, I think uh, it became pretty clear that we could make this compelling interactive exhibit. In now, Fred, tell me, as an archaeologist, my children fondly remember that Indiana Jones project that That's you and it. Lucasfilm worked on years <laughs> ago that uh, it and it it made archaeology really cool because it took the fake artifacts from Indiana Jones and melded them with these Mayan bowls and uh, I remember necklaces and all sorts of things that were there um, what was the thinking behind this exhibit and making it a 3D virtual experience, and what will people expect when they go? What we love to do at National Geographic headquarters is make the viewer, whether it's someone who's watching the television or reading the magazine or walking into an exhibit, feel like they're walking into the pages of National Geographic. Mm. We wanted to really come up with an out-of-the-box experience. Mm. Having been there, I was in Jerusalem on and off about 10 times over the course of 2016 and 2017, mm. and I was humbled by the experience, thinking that I'm one of just a few hundred people who have a chance to experience the church like this. Mm. How could I bring that experience to the greater public? What I think Corey has done is absolutely amazing. It feels like I'm going back to Jerusalem. Wow. It's hugely successful. And, it's un and when you go into the Edicule, when you walk in through the Chapel of the Angels and yes. into the tomb area, it is when the tomb is exposed without the marble covering. No, the scanning that look? we did. The scanning that we did was while the marble covering is in place. Uh -huh. So it looks right now in the exhibit exactly as it looks today if you go visit it. Okay. So although it was a historic moment to have the cover removed, mm -hmm. what we really wanted in the experience is to have it look as it's looked for the last you know thousand. Years and you have before. photographs and video of all of that, of course. Yep. Yes, so we people do. can see that as well That's and right. experience it. And you can walk about the entire church. Pretty I'm much. told in yeah, the virtual right. experience. That's right. So that, that's one of the see. That's one of the benefits of this virtual experience is the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is too big to recreate one to one inside of our museum, mm -hmm. but we can virtually take you through the entire church, through the courtyard, past the anointing stone. You can mm. look up at Golgotha. You can right. go to the Edicule and in the. And that's amazing. People don't realize how close Absolutely. the tomb from the crucifixion site, how exactly. close it is. It's all under the same roof in that church. Yep. It's a couple hundred feet away. And it's an amazing. I mean, historically, it. I mean, they seem to think this is probably the most archaeologically sound site of all the religious sites in, in Jerusalem, the Christian sites anyway. It, it certainly is one of the epicenters of Christianity. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that it has been raised and Jerusalem's been invaded and there have been fires and earthquakes every time comes back to the actual importance of the location of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm. It really does become X marks the spot. Yeah. And there is even a place in the church, right close to the edicule, which says, this is the center of the world. Wow. Wow is right. Hmm. What did you, I read a report where you said when you walked in and they were, they had pulled the marble covering off, that your knees were shaking when you walked in. It sure was. It was, uh, it was a very emotional experience. It was late at night. Uh, we had mm. closed the church doors for the first time in hundreds and hundreds of years. So it was very special to be inside with about 50 monks, about 25 uh, architectural restorers, and a small gaggle of us from National Geographic. And to hear the sound of that marble being moved off mm -hmm. of that, I will never forget that. And then being able to go and look in. Mm. We have an interview with one of the monks who feels, he explains that, that he was changed by looking in and the reporter says, well, what did you see? And he said, rock, the holy rock. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point. That's it. That's the whole That's point. It. That's, That's it. That's the whole point. Corey Fred, thank you so much for being here. The Tomb of Christ, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre experience at the National Geographic Museum here in D.C. is certainly worth your time. It will be on exhibit from now through August 15th, 2018. So you have plenty of time to see it. Visit nationalgeographic.org slash D.C. for more details. Thanks so much. Fascinating. Um, thing that you've captured and a moment in history that uh, you'll allow millions of people to have access to. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you.